We're going to be starting in verse 23 and tonight we're going to be speaking about the table of showbread. And as I have been opening it up to you, I have been showing it to you that we have been, uh, this is just the third message already, but I have been showing it to you according to the pattern that is revealed to us in the scriptures. There, was a, there were six pieces of furniture in the tabernacle and there are three compartments within those six pieces of furniture. There is an outer court, which is the outer extremity of the tabernacle. In that outer court where all of Israel could come into, there were two pieces of furniture. There was a brazen laver and a brazen altar. The altar was for the sacrifice, the laver was for the priest to be cleansed before they even took up any of the sacrifices. Then there was a tent or a sanctuary within that outer court, outer court area which contained two other compartments. One compartment was called the holy place realm and the other compartment was called the holy of holies realm. The holy place held three pieces of furniture. One of them was called the candlestick, the other one was the golden altar of incense, and the other one was the table of showbread which we're going to be studying tonight. And then finally there was the holy of holies which only had one piece of furniture in it which was the Ark of the Covenants. Now, one of the first, first, one of the first things I uh, studied in the Word of God that intrigued me very much when I was a Christian was the tabernacle. And uh, it's probably one of the most best pictures that God ever drew for us concerning His purpose and His plan. Sometimes human language or words cannot convey what the Spirit wants to say. And what God, I believe, here did in giving us the tabernacle is that He drew us a picture in the Spirit for us to interpret in the Spirit as to, the, as to what God is simply saying to us according to His purposes and His plans for His people. And again, many, many times, you know, uh, you ever hear the old saying, a picture paints a thousand words? Well, I believe that's exactly what God did when He gave us a tabernacle. He literally painted a picture, picture for us in the Spirit regarding all of the glory of Christ and not only only the glory of Christ but when you carry it into the New Testament you really see the real beauty of it because the people in the Old Testament just saw the types and the shadows and the figures they didn't really have the understanding like you're having it today you see and although they saw this pillar of fire although they were able to touch everything with their senses and feel everything with their physical flesh the reality was they didn't understand it because they didn't have it inside of them and what the prophets were looking for and what the prophets were looking into uh, they didn't even have, and, and the understanding that we have in the New Testament is now being given to us of things that were hidden for ages. Man, it's just something, the way people just can take this so lightly so many times, huh? Not even, oh, well, you know, it's just another church service, another thing, and you know, but the, but, but the things that God has revealed to the body of Christ in this hour are things that the people and the prophets and the Old Testament saints did not know and they, they wished that they could learn them. And the only things that they lived in were nothing but shadows and types. We're now living in the reality of it. Well, if you go over to 1 Corinthians, you really begin to see the true beauty of the tabernacle when the, Paul picks up the verse and says, You are the temple of God. And when you really begin to understand and see that you are the temple of God, then this picture that God drew for us over 4,000 years ago was a picture of all the glory of Christ that's inside of the people of God. You see? Everything that the Old Testament saints saw, we have it inside of us. So when you take a look at this tabernacle, it's not only a picture of Jesus, okay? But to order, in order to understand the whole revelation of it, it's not only a picture of Jesus, but it's a picture of Jesus inside of you. Because you are the temple. You are the tabernacle of God. You are the house of God. Therefore, if, if I'm the house of God, and I'm the temple of God, and I'm the tabernacle of God, then it, we just go to assume that everything in the tabernacle represents what's inside of me in the, in the, in the image and in the form of Christ. So really, in order to get the whole understanding of what the tabernacle is, it's not just a picture of Jesus, but it's a picture of His glory, of His power, of His image, of everything that He is within us, and it's seeking to express itself in a, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a supernatural, divine way. Now when you take a look at this picture from that perspective, that it's not just Jesus, but it's Jesus in you, it really brings out some more beautiful things about the tabernacle. 
Because when I did a lot of study, when I picked up the books on the tablet, books, uh, the, the books that I picked up are all good books. There's nothing wrong with them. They're all tremendous insights into the tabernacle. I picked up a lot of books on it. I read a lot of books on them. And one thing what was unique about all the, all the material that I read was that the majority of the material I read what, took a look at the tabernacle from the in, outside in. For example, they would, they would begin their teaching from taking a look at what's happening in the outer court. Then they would proceed to teach what's going on in the holy place, in the church realm. And then finally get into the holy of holies where the presence and the glory of God was. And that was all fun until God showed it to me and said, I want to reverse that for you because if you take a look at the pattern in the Bible and the way I told Moses to build it, I never told him to begin on the outside. I told him to begin with the most innermost compartment with the first piece of furniture in the most holy place and it was the Ark of the Covenant. And when you take a look at the pattern in the, within the Bible, you find that the first piece of furniture God speaks of and the first piece of furniture that God told Moses to build was not what was going on in the outer court, but rather he told him to first build the Ark of the Covenants. Because that's where God begins. You see, and that's where God want us, wants us to understand that all of his working and all of his dealing and all of his image and all of his purpose begins within a people. It doesn't begin outside of a people. It begins within us. All of the purpose and all of the presence and that glory cloud that the people are looking for is all inside of us already. Now what we've got to come to understand is that there is a glory that is yet to be revealed. That is in us and that glory shall be revealed through us and shall be manifested upon the people of the earth and upon the nations. But you need to understand the beautiful thing is, is that if you take a look at the way God gave it to Moses and that's the way I'm going to give it to you. Exactly in the pattern that was outlined in the Bible because every piece of furniture as it's seen even its place in the Bible had a purpose. Its order, okay? Its arrangements, the way it was arranged, the way God told Moses to arrange it, okay? Is, 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 is a purpose and a divine order for that. So when we see that God began with the ark, when you see the first piece of furniture in Exodus 25 as being the ark of the covenant, there was a reason for that, okay? There was a reason for that. There was a reason why He started with the ark of the covenant. To let us better understand and let us better see that that presence, that throne of God, that glory of God resides inside of us. And I showed you last week about the Ark of the Covenant that this Ark resides within us and, and it, it is literally the throne of God. It is where God is seated. It is the presence of God where the presence of God is seated and where He sits. And whenever God has done something in your life, that's your Ark. Whatever He's done for you, that becomes your Ark because what, the only thing that God lives in is what He builds. He doesn't, build in any, he doesn't live in anything that He doesn't build. You see? So if He's building something within us, He begins with that presence, with that working of God. And that working of God is the very thing that God has done in your life. That's His ark. That's your throne room in there. You see? And what God wants us to understand is that what the Lord wants us to understand is that what He's done in your life, even, even just getting saved, okay? What He's done in your life initially, God wants to use that as His throne room so that others may come to you and receive from that throne room where the presence of God is seated. You see? So there's a, there's a glory within you, there's a working of God within you and within that working of God that God has done in your life, that's where the presence of God is seated. You know, people just trying to get man to... they want man to do things and man can't do nothing. Man can't do nothing from God. God begins with Himself. You know, people are trying to work for God. You can't work for God. God's got to start the work within Himself and He puts that within us and He uses that as the basis by which we can now become God's throne. Because it was out from that throne room, it was out from the Ark of the Covenant where the high priest would enter in and then he would exit out and he would proclaim liberty and forgiveness to the whole nation of Israel. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to take what He has done in our lives and now He wants to manifest it. He wants to express it. He wants to demonstrate it. He wants to give it to those that are in need of it. You see? And there's a tremendous working of God that God has already done in your lives. And He wants you to know, know, know that the work that He's done in your life, He wants that to become His throne room. His mercy seat. His place where His presence is seated so that others may come to you and receive from that which God has done in your life. 
Amen? Now, a very, very interesting or very interesting pattern occurs. You really got to take a look at this in the pattern that it was made. Because when you see the pattern of the tabernacle and the way it's outlined for us in the Bible, something very, very interesting comes up in the pattern. So first, we got away from the whole idea of going from the outer court into the holy place and the holy of holies. We start with the first piece of furniture that God mentions is the Ark of the Covenants. Now the second piece of furniture, and this is what you've got to pay close attention to, the second piece of furniture that he mentions in the arrangement in scriptures, all right? If you take it just from the scriptures and just take a look at the Bible and the way it's outlined or patterned for us, the second piece of furniture that is mentioned is the table of showbread. Now when you take a look at that, there's something wrong with it. There's something wrong with that arrangement. And it's this. Please take a, a, a look at the second picture. The second picture that I gave you. Right over here. Get a zoom up on that and make it real good. If you take a look at the, at the pattern of the visual picture, the visual picture, the second piece, now this is the thing that struck me, the second piece of furniture that you should see or that you should make mention of, should be outlined in the Bible, is the altar of incense. Because in where you're seated in the ark, if we start with the ark, we're going to come through the veil, and as we pass through the veil, the first piece of furniture we should see is the altar of incense. So by arrangements, or listen to me, by visual picture, the picture that you see right there, by a visual picture, the next piece of furniture by the visual picture should be the altar of incense. Get it back on me for again, listen to me. When I was doing this study, when God was opening this whole thing up to me, and as I was reading it in the Bible, after I read the ark, the second piece of furniture I expected God to mention was the altar of incense. But it wasn't mentioned. I said, well, wait a second, Lord. You told me to start from the inside, and I did. And now I'm starting to come out. How come the arrangement in the Bible and how you make it is all mixed up? Matter of fact, the altar of incense isn't mentioned to the last piece of furniture. And God said, don't let's look at the picture, but read what I got in the Bible. Now again, that visual picture that you get, let me go one more time. This way you can see it. One more time in that second picture. Again, if you take a look at the arrangement, visualizing it with the eye, you see that first you begin with the ark, and again, you pass through the veil, and if you're coming out, the first piece of furniture again you should see is the altar of incense, but God just r runs right over it. And I'll tell you why. Because what God does with that altar, and what God is doing inside of you through that altar, you're not ready for it yet. So God's got to bypass it, because remember, it's the, it's the last piece of furniture that stands right before the veil. So what God is saying in this, He's saying He's going to use that piece of furniture in us to bring us beyond the veil. But before we get beyond, it's going to come in full circle. That's why the altar of incense is the last piece of furniture that He mentions in scriptural arrangement. By visualizing it, if you take a look at it again, from the outside in, you would begin with the ark, and then the second piece of furniture, by, by visualizing it, should be the altar. But in the scriptures, it's nuts. It's the last piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to teach on the altar of incense, but again, to let you better understand this, you need to see that God just bypasses that whole thing, because there's a greater purpose into that altar, what it means. And God is showing He's coming full circle. He begins on the inside, He comes out, and He's going right back in again. He starts from the inside, he manifests and demonstrates everything that he has to do, expresses it, sets the people free, and then he brings itself all back into a people again. It's like, it's like a breathing in and a breathing out. That's why he jumps right over the altar and he doesn't mention it to the last piece of furniture. Because it's like, it's like the breath of God. God is breathing in and he's breathing out. You see? Now, he jumps over the altar and he goes right to the table. Because in reality is, this is the next piece of furniture that you will come in contact with after you understand your place as being the Ark of the Covenants. Okay? Jesus is the Ark, but Jesus is in us and He wants to be that mercy seat, that throne. 
to God's creation. He wants to use us as those people to minister that mercy, minister that love, minister forgiveness, minister grace, minister goodness. It all comes from that throne room of God. But you see, as we're ministering it, the second place that we come to is not to the altar, but we go to the table. Because it was at the table where the priests would gather and have fellowship one to another. They would all sit around that table and they would have fellowship. Matter of fact, they wouldn't sit, they would stand. Now let's take a look at this. At the table of showbread, it was a table. Okay? Oh, we'll read it in just a moment, but it was a table. And it had 12 loaves of bread on it. And if you can, please, Jennifer, get a load of that picture once again. I'm going to read the scripture verses, but before we do, let's just take a look at that picture. The first picture, get a good zoom in on it. The first picture right here. The table of showbread. And you'll find that it basically looks like a table. It had 12 loaves on it. 12 loaves of bread. Showbread it was called. I like what the word showbread means. It means face of His presence. Hallelujah. Face of His presence. You see, and the reality is, look at me for a minute. When we share the bread with each other, when we share the word with each other, we're actually sitting in the face of God's presence. When you share with me what God has done, and when you share with me the word that God has enriched your life with, I'm looking into the presence of God as you're sharing it with me. You see? It has, it has now the, the 12, uh, 12 uh, loaves of bread. 12, you can see 12 run like a thread throughout Scripture, because 12 is a governmental number. 12 tribes, 12 saints, 12 apostles... 12, you see the 12 the gates of the city. You see the 12 outlined in all the, in all the run line because it has to do with the government of God or the kingdom of God. So what God is saying, He's saying as we eat and partake of the bread of God's presence, what we're actually doing is that we're manifesting the kingdom of God on the earth. The kingdom of God is being manifested as we break the word of God between each other. As you speak the word of God to me, and I speak the word of God to you, and that bread of God's word is broken between us, it's actually going to establish the place of God's kingdom within us. Oh, hallelujah. We don't realize how powerful the word is. And there is a... Okay, Jennifer, you can, you can get this back on me again. You, you never, uh, we never get to really realize that we're at that ark. The second place that God brings us to is the table because after God does His work in you, the next thing that He wants you to do is that He wants you to give it and share it with somebody else in the body of Christ. Whatever God has done in your life, whatever kind of an ark you are, whatever kind of a throne you are, whether you're a throne of mercy, a, th a throne of grace, a throne of goodness, a throne of forgiveness, a throne of love, whatever kind of throne you are, God doesn't want you to keep that throne to yourself, but now He wants you to bring you to the table of showbread where you can share it with other believers in Christ. Amen. That's why He died, jumps right over the altar and goes directly to the showbread. Because after God has caused you to become His throne, now He wants you to share that throne with your, with your brethren. After He's caused me and made me become a throne of faith, a throne of God's living word, a throne where His mercy is, after He's done that working in me, whatever testimony you have, you know what the Ark of the Covenant was called? It was called the Ark of His testimony. Now oh, Randy, please give, give this sweet sister here one of these uh, uh, things. And if you see anybody else coming in, just, just give them to them. Whatever throne you are, Whatever work God has done in your life, God wants you to now take it and give it and dispense it to other people. Amen. Now you see, now this tabernacle is the pattern of how God builds His church. We think God builds His church by, you know, by uh, all kinds of crazy things. Programs, rituals, ceremonies, every other kind of thing that man can conjure up. Any kind of politic that man can conjure up to build his church, that's what man uses. But God isn't building a church this way. God builds his church by starting out with people that he's already done a work within. And says, that's my ark. Now for my ark, after the work he's done in you, now he takes you and brings you to the table and he makes you share it with each other. So whatever of Christ that you have, 
He lets you come directly now to the table so that you can give it to me. And whatever God has done within your life, now you can come to the table and now give it to me because I need it. You see, that was at the table that they had the fellowship, one with another. And, and the other court, they, they ministered, they did whatever they had to do. But when they came into the table of showbread, they all gathered for that quiet time between the brethren. That sharing between the brethren and what God had done in the outer court. You see, they may have been in the outer court, maybe some, some no good sin that came to, the, came, to the, came to the altar and wanted to give a sacrifice. And maybe God did some tremendous things in that outer court with the people of Israel. But then there was a time where they would come into the table of showbread and share it with each other. You see? So I, from the ark, God brings us directly to the table so that we can minister it to each other. Hallelujah. We don't, it's at this table that we begin to realize just how important we are to each other. And that every vessel here is special and precious in the eyes of God. And what we begin to see at this table of showbread where we break the bread between each other, and that bread represents the Word of God, and as we share the Word of God with each other, we begin to find out that what I have isn't enough. I still need what you got to give to me as well. So we break the bread. And we share it with each other So because I need what you have and you need what I got. And this is how God built His church. He builds his church first by God doing a work in you and after he finishes doing the work, he says, now go out and break it. Go out and cherish. Now let's look at Exodus chapter 25. See, when you come to the table, you begin to realize just how important a local body is. See, you can become the ark and stay as the ark your whole Christian life. But unless you begin to realize and understand that after God has made you become his ark, after He's made you become the habitation of His presence, there is now a local body that He wants to place you in. You will not be in to realize just how important your brethren are to the purposes of God in your life. You see that? And I tell you something, after God does a work, I mean, you could have gotten saved in your bedroom. Without no, hearing no evangelist, hearing no... But the first thing that God will do is that He'll take you and He'll knit you with a local body. Not men's programs, not a church system, not a religious system, but He will knit you with a local body. Because that local body needs what you got from God. So God says, alright, come on, I'll bring you right here. Because you need something from them and they need something from you. That's the table. You see, at, there's something very, very strange about this table. And it's this, there's no, there's no chairs there. There's no chairs at the table. Everybody was standing up. You see, when you come to the body of Christ, and when you come to the church, and when you come to each other and share with each other, you don't sit down and just take a rest. We're here to work. Amen? We're here to stand. We're here to serve each other. We're not here to sit. Amen? Too many tables have become, they've become sitting grounds where people sit down and they just relax and it's become the same old thing every day. Every Sunday they hear the same old message. They just sit down and let the preacher do all the work. They got nothing to say. They got nothing to do. When, anybody, when they're called upon to do something, they run out of the church because they're sitting down all the time. But at this table, there's no chairs. You've got to be standing up because if, you want, if, if, if God has called you to this table, you're going to know what it means to serve. You're going to know what it means to serve other people. You're going to know what it, what it means. To be a servant of Christ. And isn't it something? I mean, after the ark, after God has placed us in the ark and lifts us up to the very throne of God, what do you think? He keeps us up there? No, He brings us down and lets us become servants to each other. So the highest place in the kingdom is not on a throne, but it's to be a slave. Uh, let's read this. Exodus 25. I said, I'm going to read it. Let's read it. I mean, this, this blew me away when I saw it. When we come to verse 23, I was expecting to see the altar. But it was no altar. The table was there. And you know what I did? I'm starting to run crazy through the screen. I remember looking through it. Look, wait, where is the altar? It's all the way in the back someplace. I said, what in the world is it doing back there? He said, because you're not ready for it yet. After you, buy, after you come out of the ark, you're not ready for what holds in that altar. So he brings us to the table so that we can know what it means to be a servant to each other. 
Let me tell you something. There is no uh, no promotions in the kingdom of God if you're not willing to be a servant. God cannot promote any anointing on your life if you are not first willing to understand what it means to serve. Now you know what you know what's the matter with us? We have been so abused and so hurt by serving man that when we come to the church, we think that serving God is the same way that it is to serve man. We think that serving man, that serving God means that God is going to make demands on us. And that He's going to say, well, you better do it or else. Or, uh, you know, uh, you know if, 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 you don't, if you don't do this certain thing, then you're just going to go to hell. And how many people have been hurt by serving man? You see, when you serve a man in the church, and, and for a man's purpose, you're going to find yourself going down a wrong alley. People think, well, I'll stay in the church because the pastor needs my prayer. And he doesn't really have, have the message I have, but I'm willing to stay here and pray for him. Honey, you don't belong there at all. When God is ready to do a move in that church, the first one that He'll speak through is through the pastor. You want to pray for Him? You don't have to come and, and attend the service and come to the church to pray for Him. You can pray for Him right on your knees as the Holy Spirit places it on your heart. I've heard so many people, well, I've got to go to that church because they need me, but they, they, I, I, wish, I wish they would uh, you know, grab a hold of the message that the Lord has given to me, but for some reason, he just don't have, so I've got to stay there and pray. That's nonsense. God doesn't want you to be in that kind of environment. God will not put you in that kind of environment. Be quite honest with you, think God doesn't even want you there. Because you've got no business being there if God hasn't put you there to be in line with a man's vision. You hear that? God places that pastor there and he's got a specific vision. And if God has not placed it on your heart to see eye to eye with him, then you don't belong there. That's not to say there's anything wrong with it, but that's, that's just the way God has structured His thing in the earth right now. You see? But at this table, we begin to learn what it means to serve. So we're so accustomed to serving men that when God says, serve me, we, we think that it's the same. It's not the same. And hopefully at this table, I'll begin to let you better understand what it means to serve God. I'll tell you something. Nobody had to twist my arm to get to church. I was there regardless. Nobody's got to twist my arm to come here and preach. Uh, this is the best time I ever have when I'm preaching. You see? Now take a look at this. Exodus 25, let's read this. Verse 23. And to be a servant of God, and, and, and please listen to this, to be a servant of God is the highest call that you can receive in your life. Because it's a call to minister. And we don't, I, I, hopefully I'll be able to better explain it, but we see the true spirit of what it means to be a servant. It's illustrated for us on the communion table. I'm going to demonstrate this for you tonight. But let's first read this, Exodus 25 and verse 23. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Notice everything was made with shittim wood again. It's all got to do with your own humanity. What's shittim wood again? It's got to do with your own humanity. It's got to do with your own, your own faults, your own failures, that, 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 that stinking flesh that comes up every now and again. Alright? God says He wants to use you just the way you are. See, we think we got to polish ourselves up before we come to God. Not really. You come to God just as you are. And what does he do? He takes you and he overlays you with his divine nature, with his gold. Let's take a look at the verse 23. Shall also make a table of shillin wood. Two cubits shall the length thereof, and a cubit and the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a hand breadth. Ah! The border of a hand breadth. You, they had, now take a look at that picture once again. Take a look at the picture, the first picture again, of the table. And you'll find that in the table, uh, there, was a, there, there was a little crown of gold that went around the entire table. Okay? 
And that crown was there in order to hold the bread in place so the bread, the bread wouldn't fall off the table. So God put a crown there. You see? And what you need to see is that God will put a crown on your life to make sure that whatever He does ain't going to fall. When He starts to do a work in your life and He begins to put that word in your life, it's well able to hold you. The word of God that God places in your heart will never let you fall. Just as the bread was on that table, it couldn't fall. That bread represents God's word. When God places His word within you, He's going to place a crown on it because that word will hold you. That word will never let you fall. And notice that it was a crown of a hand breadth. Oh, hallelujah. You know what the hand always represents? It represents the fivefold ministry. So God has placed His ministry on this table. He has planted His fivefold ministry on this table to minister to the people of God. He's placed the office of the pastor, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher on this table to minister to the people of God. And you see, as that word comes forth from His anointed ministries, the word or the bread of life that is ministered to you through this hand breath, through this ministry, through the fivefold office gifts, the word that you receive in your heart will never let you fall. See, if you receive a genuine word from a genuine minister, from an anointed ministry, and that word gets inside, it, that word is well capable to hold you and to never let you fall off the table. I don't have time to discuss what the fivefold ministry represents. But let me tell you something. Everybody that calls himself an apostle is not an apostle. Just because a person can start other churches doesn't mean that he's an apostle. Okay? If I have the ability to start churches in California, in Texas, in Mexico, in Canada, in South Africa, that doesn't make me an apostle. What makes a man an apostle is that the man that's chosen to be an apostle will receive a unique revelation of God that was never heard of before. And it's always... Uh, it's, it's, it's always uh, backed by signs and wonders in a supernatural divine way. Okay? It is, to be an apostle means to be in a place where you've now given something to the body that has caused a revolution in the church, something that has never happened before. That's an apostle. You see? Jesus was an apostle, meaning He gave something to us that we never had before that no man could ever give us. There were the twelve apostles that had unique experiences in God that we're still benefiting today in the church. And I could just name some modern day apostles for you. Catherine Coleman was one of them. She brought forth something in the church that was never seen. I mean, people just come into her meetings, they, the healings that took place in her meetings were, were out of the ordinary. You, it was something that was never seen before. That's what types out as an apostle, as an apostle. It's something that dramatically influences other churches, other influences the whole church, the whole move of the church. I personally believe Win Worley was an apostle. He brought forth deliverance and, and spiritual warfare in a way that was never heard. I mean, casting out demons and spitting demons up, and, and you know, people maybe listen to this tape and say, You're out of the world. But I'll tell you something that, 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 those books you pick up. But that minister has got an experience in it that is yet to even be touched by other churches today. Churches are still having a fight over that and still, compl still trying to get past all that. The Who's the Street revivals that brought forth that, well, you don't understand that, brought forth the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I personally believe Kenneth Hagin is an apostle to this generation. To this generation, that man is an apostle. That man has brought forth messages and... Um, I mean, to those that have ears to hear, he opened up something about faith that we can never hear. I haven't heard it from anybody else. You see, now that's what an apostle, that's what, what uh, word apostle means sent one. Paul was an apostle, and I'll get into this when I teach on the Pauline epistles. He received the revelation that the rest of the apostles just did not have. See, so an apostle is. You got the prophet. The prophet is the one that points you in the direction of God. I don't believe the prophet is just there to condemn you and point out your sin, but he's there to point you in the direction of God. The evangelist. 
An evangelist has got an unique anointing to draw unsaved into the meetings. I believe Billy Graham is, has a, is a genuine evangelist of our time. One of them at least. There's a lot of evangelists. But evangelists have got a call. If you place a real evangelist up here, there'll be, there'll be unsaved people that'll just come to the meeting. That's what makes an evangelist an evangelist. His ability for the unsaved to just be there. He doesn't need to... Not believers, but unbelievers. And the pastor... The pastor, he's the heart of God because he gets closer to the people than any of the other fivefold ministers. You see, we benefit and profit from all these things put together. And, and that's how the Word of God is instilled in our lives through these fivefold gifts, through these fivefold ministers. You see? The Word of God is established. That bread has been set on the table by this hand breath that God has established in the church. Okay? So, so I feel sorry for these long rangers that think that they can just do what they want to do. And you know, never get and oh well, I'm with God. I'm gonna sit home tonight and I'm gonna I'm gonna get along with God and I'll get the word for myself. You lying devil. That's not but a deceiving spirit that's on that person. When that person can't come to church and everything stops that person from getting taught the word of God, there's another spirit at work. Make no mistake about it, because you're not gonna get this thing alone at home. God didn't design it that way. That's why he's got a table there. That table ain't just for you alone. That table is for all of the rest of the priests in the house of God to come and share it. You see? Let's read the rest of it. Verse 26, And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. That means that it was to be carried. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood. In verse 29 it speaks about the di dishes and the spoons. I'll, I'll get to that later on. But just to show you that this table speaks about the importance of the local body, just bring, let me give you a New Testament scripture. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So you see the table is significant of the Lord Jesus Christ as being the bread of life to us. Jesus said that I am the bread of life. Okay? So when you see Jesus Christ, this table of showbread, it literally represents Christ as the bread of life to you. Christ being the bread of life to you. You see? Now that table ain't going to do me no good if I don't go there and eat something from it. You see? I know Jesus said that I am the bread of life. What good is that bread if I can't eat it? It becomes the bread of life to me when I can get to the table and eat it. When I can get the word instilled inside of me, then it, become, then it becomes a bread of life. When I can benefit from the word that God has given to you, then I've come to the table. Because I've eaten, I've partaken of the bread of life from someone else. Man, it's so sad to see people just don't have the ability to listen to anybody else. Is it something? God wants us to have the ability to listen. Because in listening, we'll partake of that bread and receive from that bread. Look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. It says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Jump down to verse 26. And whether one member, member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member beyond it, all the members rejoice with it. Now you know what that means? That means having a consciousness of the body. When you come to the table... You will become conscious of the body. What does that mean, conscious of the body? It means that even though you're not assembled here in this building, your heart will feel the rest of the brethren as God permits it during the day. Amen. You will be on, you, the people of the church will be on your mind and on your heart and you will lift them up in prayer during the day. And many times God will speak to you and show you the condition of some of the people and cause you to lift them up in prayer. That's what it means to have a conscience of the body. It doesn't mean that you're out there just doing your own thing and you don't think about the church until it comes time to come to church. Because some people can only think about church when they're physically, when it's time, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, get to church. And that's the only time they can think about the church is when they're physically there. But you see, when you come to the table, you're there 24 hours a day. How many times you got to feed yourself during the day, huh? 
got to feed yourself at least three times a day. And then uh, we won't include all the snacks that we have in between. Huh? It's the same thing with us. When we have a consciousness of the body, at least three times a day, we're going to be lifting people up in prayer. You're, you're going to be people are going to be on the people's hearts. And you know what will happen if you feel the rest of the, if you feel the heartbeat of the people, it'll keep you holy. You won't sin because you'll feel responsible to the people of God. You'll, have, you'll feel responsible for what God has given you for them. So, so when we go away from here, you're on my mind all the time. I think about you constantly. I think about Julie during the day. I think about Rebecca. I think about Randy. I think about Joan. I think about all these. You'll just pop into my mind and when I pop into my mind, I'll just start praying for you. You know, some people say, well, I haven't come to church and I haven't seen some people in here sometimes in months, but I want to tell you something. If I can't get to the phone and call you, I, 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 I can sit here with an honest conscience and say, you're on my heart. I'm praying for you. I'm, I'm thinking about you. I've seen some people that I haven't seen in a few months, yet they're on my heart. I'm thinking about them. You see? I'm praying for them. So that's what it means to have a consciousness of the body because when you have a consciousness of the body, people, we can't get any place without each other. I can't finish what God has called me to do without you. You can't finish what God has called you to do without me. Amen. And when we begin to realize that, then we begin to feel for each other and begin to see what, what, what God is doing in the midst of us. Amen? Uh, take a look at this very quickly. Uh, it's so one other verse of scripture, Colossians chapter two. Colossians chapter two and verse nineteen. As far as God is concerned. Relationships and how we treat one another are of the highest importance. Let's take a look at this. Colossians, what did I say? Three? A two? And verse 19. Let's just read that. It says, And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourished, ministered, and knit together, increase it with the increase of God. That's tremendous. You know what God is saying that? He's saying that as... God is joining the people of God together. God Himself is increasing. Can, can I explain that a little bit more? That's tremendous. You see, because what I have of God is in all of it. It takes the body to be joined together to manifest Christ in His fullness. So when the Lord says He's joining joints and ministers together and He's joining it all together, God Himself is expanding and becoming bigger than what He originally started off with. God Himself is, in, see it says the increase of God, meaning God Him, there is an increase of the Godhead itself as God joins the body of Christ together. See, the original Godhead only started out with three. But by the end of the age, there ain't going to be three. There's going to be millions. Because, what? wow. Get that in your theological head and you'll go crazy. God started with three. But what He's going to end with is not just three. He's going to end with a whole family of God that have been knit and bounded together and God is no longer going to be seen as three. He may be seen on the millions and on the thousands, the sons that He has birthed. You know the name Elohim? Elohim means gods. G with a, God with a plural. It means the whole family of God, not just three. So God had a purpose in Himself to bring forth this whole family of God before He even started this whole thing. Your, your spirit was inside of the bosom of the Father before anything ever happened. When you came down to earth, your spirit met your body. And now what God is doing is that God is now knitting it all together 
so that at the end of the age there is going to be an increase of the God Himself. The Elohim would have expanded beyond what He originally started with in His own creation. Wow! That's, that's mind-boggling when you think about it. Now, I'm not putting myself in the same place as the one God. There's only one head and there'll always be one head. There'll never be two or three or four or five. There's only one head. But in the midst of the one head, there's this whole thing that He has arranged that made us become one. And He literally calls us not just a church, a body. Mm. Meaning that your head, is, your head can't be separated from your body and have two separate things. It's got to be one. It can't be separated. You see that? It can't be separated. It's got to be one. That's how one we are with God. We are inseparable. Me and God are inseparable. You and us are inseparable. That which God has joined together, no man can ever pull asunder. Because there is an increase of God Himself that is expanding. That is, that is tremendous. See, we don't realize that because we're still living in these senses and in this flesh. But when you begin to realize that you and Him are so one that they can't even be put apart, then you begin to see and realize the importance of this table of showbread. God gathers everybody together around this bread table because as He gathers everybody together, it's actually one Christ that is being manifested in the many. One Christ being manifested in the many. What do you see as the Godhead? One God being manifested in the many. Three right now. But when it comes to the end of the age, there's going to be one body manifested in the many. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. That which brings me to let you understand what this whole table of showbread really speaks about. The, what, what the Lord ministered to me and showed me is that the perfect picture of this can be seen in the communion table. The showbread is a perfect picture of what takes place in the communion table. So why don't we turn to that? I believe it's in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 